So um, it's an incredible honor uh, and a wonderful pleasure to have Mark Kirshner with us today to, to be featured in the series. Um, Mark is such an iconic and such an aspirational figure. Uh, it's a foolish enterprise to introduce him. So I will just let him do it in his own words. Please take it up, Mark. Okay, so 10 minutes. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, the purpose is to talk about the development of my career, and I'm going to take one thread through my career, which has been very important, maybe most important to me. And first, I want to say that um, the idea of chance playing an important role in mechanism or function is a fairly modern idea, and uh, it made a big difference in physics with the development of quantum mechanics in the 20th century, which was quite different than the uh, kinds of concepts of physics before that. Um, it certainly hit a biology in a big way with Darwin in the mid 19th century with his theory of evolution by genetic variation and natural selection, which depended on random chance processes. Um, and uh, it comes up in many other places, including things like uh, biological regulation in the mid 20th century, particularly protein and gene regulation in l theory. And it's also probably, as you'll see, since I'm supposed to talk about my own life here, the only metaphor I can imagine that describes my own career in science. Um, uh, the variations have been obvious. The selection may not always been perfect, but that's where it's gone. Um, OK, uh, so let's see, why am I? OK. So uh, I'll start with my early life and my the beginning. I grew up in Chicago in a very modest or kind of run down an area in the middle of the city. And nobody can explain, and neither can I, my fascination with books on science, with museums, with gadgets, with bird watching and leaf collecting. But I experienced no teaching of science throughout. Um, nobody in the family knew anybody who had a PhD or even had an MD degree, except for the, the pediatrician that we went to. and. Um, and uh, when, in school, they just did not teach science. And in fact, they discouraged it. Uh, they didn't like it when I would be reading books on science. Um, so uh, I had wonderful parents, nevertheless, uh, who didn't know quite what to do about my interest. Um, but, um, and all that changed a bit in school at 1957, age 12, when the Russians launched Sputnik. And then all these teachers discovered that actually science was really cool and they should be encouraging me instead of uh, discouraging me. Uh, nevertheless, I didn't do very well in elementary school, but I did much better in high school, uh, where I found surprisingly that I excelled in math, uh, but I didn't have uh, any science courses that were worth anything. Uh, There's also, you know, it was, it was more very Euclidean geometry and trigonometry and algebra, which, uh, of course, which could be very complex. And, uh, you know, I've never found a great use for solving uh, by Euclidean approaches, three-dimensional uh, problems since high school. But nevertheless, uh, I'm, always, I'm ready for it. Um, uh, and I had to learn the other things like calculus and probably on my own. I, uh, I had a girlfriend who wanted to marry a doctor when I, uh, and so I entered a six year, two year pre college pre med program at Northwestern University and proceeded immediately to drop out of the program. I finished with a major in chemistry with many courses in mathematics. And I developed through my courses that I chose a deep love for thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, uh, with a strong encouragement from Professor Irv Klotz, with whom I worked and who was a deep thinking chemical thermodynamicist. I also took courses in physical mechanics. So uh, then uh, the next phase uh, was my, discover my uh, acquaintance with um, the uses of free energy. I uh, arrived at Berkeley to do a PhD with Howard Schachman. I learned something about optics and hydrodynamics and molecular structure. I met John Gearhart, who would be a close colleague to this day. And he was switching his interest to developmental biology after he had done the great work on allosteric proteins. I took my first job at Princeton 
And um, through a longer story, I decided to study microtubule assembly. I discovered a protein called tau protein, which turned out to be quite important. And I started wondering about self-assembly at higher levels, you know, self-assembly of a, of a, of a complex pro protein seemed straightforward, but a whole cell seemed pretty hard to understand. And I had some wonderful conversations while I was at Princeton with John Hopfield. And I was very impressed with kinetic proofreading, which was another use of free energy, uh, which uh, was not the kind that was usually taught. Um, now, at this point, it was discovered that microtubules require GTP hydrolysis. And that made no sense to me. It's such a simple polymer when something like a ribosome requires no energy. And that's a perplexing question for me. Um, I moved to UCSF and I was asked to teach three lectures in Berkeley at a graduate course on allosteria, ligand binding, and a bonus lecture on actin treadmilling. And again, I started thinking about ATP and GTP hydrolysis. Uh, now, the next phase of my career is dynamic instability and how nature uses energy to avoid the constraints of detailed balance. And I knew I needed some help on this, uh, of trying to understand this better. And I kept trying to trap Terrell Hill into considering ways in which GTP and ATP free energy could affect polymer assembly and behavior, but I failed twice. And then I finally came up with a model, which I put in his face. I said, imagine a microtubule between two barriers in a cell and it undergoing this treadmilling behavior. And imagine you attach a two gram weight to one of the subunits and it moves this two gram weight from one end of the cell to the other. I said, that is work. And there was some way to connect work to this whole process of treadmilling. And that was a wonderful period, a creative period, which I worked with, with uh, Terrell. And we wrote a number of papers together. Two papers were so long, one was 120 pages, the other was 150 pages, that they had to be published in a book. Uh, people called it words by Mark Kirschner, equations by Terrell Hill, but I don't think that was fair to Terrell Hill. Uh, in any case, Tim Itchison joined my lab as a PhD student, and we discovered dynamic instability, the, and uh, we came up with a stochastic GTP cap model. And I knew at that time that nothing obvious in polymer assembly would explain this because I think Terrell and I had explored almost everything we could think of. And this was something outside that. Um, and uh, that mechanism explains a lot of what goes on in microtubules and a lot of other things. Stochastic growth and local stabilization is a powerful and general mechanism. And the last phase of my, uh, of my life was of uh, this uh, was in this area was to apply this to evolution, and this idea of variation and selection, which is going on with microtubule assembly, permeates biology from microtubules to allosteria to enzyme kinetics to the vascular system to immunology to ant foraging and to evolution itself. And John Garrett and I wrote two books and several articles on what we call facilitated variation, where we explained how an organism generates complex phenotypic change efficiently from a small number of random genetic changes. And that I think is uh, where uh, we left this idea that came early in my career. And Ying Lu was the last person who worked with me where we traded off, we talked about the trade off between speed and precision in biological recognition, again, making use of some of the same concepts. So you know, I think I can, uh, one more slide of the my own facilitators of my variation, uh, which whom I've talked about in the course of this talk. Well, please put your hands together for Mark's talk. And if uh, you have uh, questions, please jump in. Mark, was there a last word that you wanted to say? Or was this it? Uh, no, except that um, all the strange behaviors, uh, biochemistry uh, really uh, should be thought through in the light of evolution, because I think that's, uh, you know, that's certainly what we found in this case, and there are many others as well. So I'm, I think that there's, a, as you're working out mechanism, um, there's a larger uh, uh, stage to play on 
and that how this actually makes it possible uh, for a random variation to often come out with, up with the right answers. Great, thank you. So I'm opening the floor for questions. I see a raised hand. Uh, Sonia, go for it. Hi, um, thanks so much for sharing um, your history. This was really beautiful. Um, I, I was wondering if you had more thoughts about um, why there was active discouragement of you studying science pre-1957. I mean, of course, it makes sense that you know things changed in, in 57 with Sputnik, but why was there this active discouragement? Um, yes, and it really, really was active. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the uh, library, we used to go to the library, uh, we had a library in the school, and the librarian basically forbade me to read any science books. Uh, uh, and, um, and so uh, why was that? Um, I think there are two reasons. Uh, science uh, wasn't really considered something necessary uh, for showing proficiency in elementary school. Uh, you know, you're supposed to learn to read and write and count but laboriously. <laughs> I mean, I got, uh, that's why I got such poor grades in, uh, in math in elementary school, because by the time I was doing, I had so many classes where we were doing long division, I just kind of, you know, I knew I understood it the first time and then I just couldn't stand doing it. But so they felt that was one thing. And the other thing they felt was that uh, they probably became elementary school teachers in part because they themselves uh, didn't like science. You didn't have to teach science in elementary school. And um, they, uh, they felt uncomfortable with it. And uh, yeah, looking back, it's surprising that they actively discouraged it, not just failed to encourage it. That makes sense. It's it's depressing, but it psychologically makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It made them feel uncomfortable. And right. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I think there's one more raised hand. Uh, Tim, do you want to go for it? Thank you, Mark. Uh, what do you think clicked? for you in your change approach to math in your uh, learning career? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I thought from elementary school, this math was this incredibly boring subject because, you know, it was, it was just uh, manipulating numbers and with no inspir inspiration at all. Uh, but when I got to, uh, high school, particularly, we had this fantastic uh, a geometry teacher who taught it in a very Euclidean way. And I had a couple of friends who really loved mathematics. And so we would work on all the extra credit problems and he would bring in even harder problems for us to solve. And if you think Euclidean proofs are simple, they're not, they're, they're, they can be very, very uh, demanding. So um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, once I, uh, exp uh, you know, I, uh, I remember we learned how to do square root and then, you know, this is not very creative, but, you know, I found out I could do uh, cube roots and quartic roots and any kind of roots, you know, uh, by just generalizing the, the, the system. So it was kind of that there was, it just opened the possibilities. I don't, I don't think I'm a great mathematician, uh, but uh, I really did like it. And, uh, and uh, when it was just pure boredom, I really didn't like it. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump in with one last question myself. Um, I wanted to mention this, um, this editorial piece that you co-authored recently on uh, curiosity-driven science versus managed science. So my question is in the context of that piece, what is your, what is your advice for curiosity driven people who are assistant professors, not so fortunate as to have you as department head? <laughs> well, it's not just me as department head, it's to have the NIH, it's have the, the, uh, the there has been, uh, uh, without any justification, in my view, uh, a tremendous um, movement uh, toward thinking that, it, that uh, 
you can do applied things, you should do applied things. And it doesn't fit even any current history. It doesn't fit the discovery of CRISPR, for example. It doesn't fit the recombinant DNA revolution where, uh, where um, Ham Smith uh, you know, I just had found this nuclease that cut DNA in large pieces and began to explore it. And he himself said, I, I never anticipated that this cloning with this, but it, it, is, it was somebody following uh, questions that looked interesting, mechanistic questions that looked interesting. They could be theoretical, they could be experimental. And, uh, and also you can look at Bell Labs where uh, this great little group of, uh, of uh, brilliant young ph uh, physicists just invented so much that was valuable, you know, the laser, the, the uh, you know, the, the uh, whatever you want, the, the satellite communication, uh, solar cells, everything came out of this kind of uh, unfettered discovery. So there's no reason to think, but I think that it's the effect of medicine where these people feel that it, things have to be done on humans, which makes no sense at all. Mendel would have gotten up very far if he had used human genetics instead of P genetics. So, uh, and they've kind of corrupted everybody who's searching for money because, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, philanthrop uh, people who are philanthropists, they want to give money to cure Alzheimer's disease and, uh, and, and uh, venture capitalists want to start companies and everybody's just waved the white flag and given into this. And it's the thing that makes me the saddest uh, because not only uh, it does it squelch uh, basic science, but I think it really will damage in the long run discoveries that really will have practical benefit. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, everybody, please, please join in thank, thanking Mark again. And we are a little bit over, but it was worth every minute of it. And now we are handing it over to Chantel, who is the host today, and will take you into your small group discussions. Take it away, Chantel. Got it. Okay, I'm opening.